All right, the recording is on and we can get started. Take it away, Ron. Fine. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this call. Um, so in terms of uh, today's webinar, uh, I just want to give some uh, pr preliminary uh, information. Uh, so to uh, follow along, you can uh, grab all the materials at bsaic.org slash Afghanistan dash call. Um, I want to clarify to everyone that this call will be recorded and shared for those who cannot make it today. Uh, so just wanted to clarify that. And uh, in, I know folks will have uh, a number of questions regarding the unfolding crisis. So if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature in, in the Zoom chat. Uh, there is no such thing as bad question. Um, however, not every question can be answered, uh, but some of the questions will be answered by the panelists themselves, either during the Q&A or in their presentation. Uh, finally, uh, if anyone wants to follow up or be part of any campaigns, you can fo follow up by emailing sc.international at bsacommittees.org. So uh, what are the goals for this event? Uh, well, we have a few. Uh, one, to develop a shared under baseline understanding of what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Uh, two, share immediate calls to action around refugees. And three, to channel the energy that we are feeling into long-term and sustained internationalist anti-war organizing in DSA. Now let's go over the agenda. Um, we have a few uh, guest speakers here today who will give their perspectives uh, so our first guest speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Zahir Bahab, who will give a, a historical background uh, into Afghanistan and give us a primer on what is happening on the ground today. Um, he is Professor Emeritus at Lewis and Clark College and also worked for the Afghan Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, next up will be Dr. Taimur Rahman, uh, who is the General Secretary of the uh, Masdur Kisan Party and who is an Associate Professor at Lahore University of Management Sciences in Pakistan. And uh, our final guest speaker is Mei Jiang, who is an investigative journalist who has, who has done much in-depth reporting uh, on the US war in Afghanistan, including the uh, hospital bombing in Kunduz. Uh, following the guest speakers, we'll have a 15 minute uh, Q&A with the panelists, uh, followed by calls to action for DSA members. All right. So that is the overview of the agenda. I will now give the floor to Dr. Uh, Zahir Wahab, who will give us uh, who will give us this presentation. Good morning, and thank you all. Uh, and I would like to um, dedicate this uh, webinar to uh, uh, our good um, friend and mentor and inspirer, uh, Michael Harrington. Uh, I wonder what he would say about the other America. Uh, in the other world uh, if he were alive today. Um, what I'd like to do is to uh, very briefly um, update you on what has been happening on the ground. I was just reading the uh, local press, um, um, the Afghan local press, uh, to see what was uh, happening. Uh, uh, because if you watch the corporate uh, press in America, uh, you would think that there actually is no country like Afghanistan, but there's an airport uh, there with uh, a lot of activity, you know, uh, U.S. military planes, other planes, and uh, uh, crowds trying to get on, the, on a plane uh, with or without a visa to, um, to see if they can change their lives. Uh, uh, it is astonishing that the corporate press uh, would only focus on the the sensational, the dramatic, the very self-serving, uh, how wonderful you know, we are and we're saving these people uh, from hell uh, when there are about 34 million people um, you know, who are experiencing uh, difficulties right now and there's hardly um, any talk about that. Um, right now, um, as you know, the Taliban took over Afghanistan uh, exactly about a week ago. Uh, and the previous uh, uh, president, uh, Ashraf Ghani, with his uh, um, um escaped uh, the country allegedly with um, loads and loads of uh, 
millions uh, and are is living happily in um, Dubai. Um, uh, right now in Afghanistan, um, um, the banks are closed. Uh, there's no government uh, as such. Um, education institutions are closed. Um, prices have uh, skyrocketed. Uh, the Western Union would not um, send you send mo any money to Afghanistan, uh, and the United States has actually frozen the ten billion dollars that in the Afghanistan has uh, in uh, um, American banks. Uh, government employees uh, have not been paid in two weeks, um, and as you know, in Afghanistan, about eighty-five percent of the people really have no savings and no bank accounts. So um, uh, life is very hard, uh, but uh, it's more or less uh, controlled uh, and uh, um, you know, orderly. Um, the latest is that the Taliban, uh, Mullah Baradar, one the deputy from Doha has arrived in Kabul itself um, uh, and uh, is trying to meet with uh, a self-styled uh, council uh, consisting of Mr. Karzai, Mr. Hikmatyar, uh, and Mr. Abdullah. Uh, they have been talking uh, and also talked with the two other Taliban representatives. They're um, trying to talk about uh, the formation of what they call an inclusive um, government. Uh, the Taliban have appointed, at this point it seems, all the governors for the 34 provinces and all of the um, uh, mayors uh, and also have appointed uh, the Minister of Public Works uh, and the Taliban um, representative for higher education um, has met in Herat with the university people and has said apparently that henceforth uh, there will be no co-education in Afghanistan because uh, he considers it to be the root of all uh, evil. Um, and so, but educational institutions are all closed, just like the government itself. Um, uh, so there's essentially nobody really in charge. Uh, the Taliban have occupied the whole country, including the presidential palace in Kabul. Uh, and when I saw pictures of the president's palace, uh, honestly, I was embarrassed. Uh, I think it would uh, embarrass even Martha Stewart, uh, looking at the furniture, the chandeliers, the artwork, the carpets and so forth. Um, uh, it struck me as obscene, uh, giving all this luxury, you know, in one of the poorest countries on earth where 80% of the people right now um, can't eat. Um, so, uh, the trio of the Karzai, Abdullah, and Hikmatyar have been meeting with Taliban representatives, and these are to, um, uh, you know, increase, uh, and they're trying to form a quote, what they call uh, an inclusive uh, government. Uh, the Taliban uh, have so far issued three main documents. Uh, one was a major press conference uh, by Zabihullah Mujahid uh, three or four days ago. Uh, and I have a transcript in English. Uh, and then uh, the Taliban wrote a letter to the Ministry of Higher Education or about higher education, uh, what they hope to accomplish. Um, and then uh, they also issued a 13 point decree, uh, sort of a proclamation, uh, you know, what the Taliban policy would be. And all of this was reinforced by another Talib representative um, yesterday uh, in a press conference. Uh, in short, uh, when you look at these documents, uh, the Taliban um, are very clear, uh, as they put it, uh, you know, they have declared the general, general amnesty to all people. Um, they uh, have left the, the press. They say the press will, can continue as is, uh, will be free. Um, and they say we, the, the war is over. Uh, we don't need uh, enemies, uh, external or internal. Uh, they're asking um, uh, all Afghans uh, to stay in Afghanistan and those who are outside to come back and help the country. 
uh, they're assuring all of the internationals, uh, you know, the UN, the embassies, the NGOs, the contractors, the observers, the journalists, uh, they're being assured that we will guarantee their safety and security and their freedom. Uh, they have said to the woman, they're saying to the women uh, that we would respect and guarantee all of your rights. Um, so this is uh, uh, their position, declared position. Um, on practice, uh, here and there, you know, there are um, aberrations. Uh, there have been clashes uh, between some of the Taliban rank and file people uh, and some uh, people over the Afghan flag, for example, uh, because two days ago it was the Afghan Independence Day and there were some people in Kabul and Jalalabad who said we want to preserve the old uh, tricolor flag, um, flag instead of the Taliban flag. Uh, flag. Uh, and then finally the Taliban relented and said uh, the flag doesn't uh, matter to us. Um, so uh, this is the political uh, economic situation. Um, the vast majority of the people are suffering. Uh, and on top of you know, this political upheaval, there's also the question of a very severe Delta Corona uh, in Afghanistan. And it's a very poor country. You know, it doesn't have the resources to deal with this. And there's also a very severe drought in most of Afghanistan, and which has affected uh, agriculture, uh, you know, vegetables and fruits, but also the water supply simply for uh, drinking. And then on top of that, you have the, uh, the political upheaval. So uh, in short, if the corporate press were really in interested in, in concern with Afghanistan as a country, this is what they should be dealing with, you know, the, the actual situation on the ground for the vast majority of the people uh, um, who, according to the World Food Program, say 80% of the Afghans right now need uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, children, women, men. And yet when you watch the news, uh, you would think again that there's no country actually, the only place that exists is um, the, the airport, and there too, you know, trying to show these frantic and desperate Afghans who are trying to get out, and then uh, the United States coming in trying to save the world. Um, so, and I think this is a service uh, by the West, by the corporate media, uh, a sort of disservice to Afghanistan and the United States and, and the rest of the world. Uh, there are about half a million internally displaced uh, people. Um, you know, in, in short, life is uh, pretty hard. Uh, so one can ask, you know, uh, how we got here. We all know that the U.S. Uh, invaded and occupied uh, Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, um, uh, knowing, uh, or we know, that Afghanistan really had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, yet Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld, Condi Rice, Khalilzad and these people decided to forego negotiations with the then Taliban government um, regarding bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and simply launched the assault and the occupation as President Bush put it, he said he was not interested in negotiations and a political solution to this problem. So since October 2007, the US and then its allies, NATO and so forth, have been um, collectively punishing uh, the whole nation of Afghanistan. Uh, at this point, we all know the statistics, you know, the enormous amount of money that was spent by the US on both the military and uh, so forth, the, the casualties, uh, American, international and Afghan. Um, the last 20 years have been a disaster. Uh, but also, uh, in order to justify its occupation, the United States then declared, quote, um, a nation building. Uh, you know, the promise then was that uh, uh, the U.S. was there to fight international, uh, quote, terrorism, uh, but also to uh, bring uh, freedom, progress, prosperity, and democracy to Afghanistan, liberate women, end the narcotics culture, but also bring stability both to Afghanistan and to um, the region. Uh, 
subsequently, uh, we have all seen what has actually happened in this regard. None of these proclaimed objectives have been achieved. Uh, Afghanistan over the last 20 years was um, a killing field. Um, you know, uh, people, poverty has increased, um, suffering has increased. Um, and, you know, people have a, a very uh, difficult uh, life. Um, and the Afghan government, which the United States put in power, uh, the, Af the Afghan government, uh, the elections were fraudulent and a farce. Uh, the Afghan governments have proven to be um, ineffective, uh, inefficient, um, and dysfunctional. Uh, the governments have failed to provide um, the basic needs of the people uh, and on. Uh, the governments have been corrupt um, um, and criminal, uh, one can say. Um, and finally, the uh, um, Afghan government, uh, Mr. Ghani, as I said, escaped about a week ago with tons of money without telling anybody, uh, you know, where he's going and why he's leaving, abandoning the, uh, the country. So the situation, in other words, uh, is um, rather um, uh, very tragic and uh, very, very difficult. Uh, and the people are not being told as to how we came to this situation. Um, in a way, it's sort of a failure, a massive failure of the US and allied governments. It's also a failure of the Afghan ruling elite and click the predatory uh, class, uh, and they should both uh, be held accountable and uh, be re responsible. And so I would submit that, you know, the uh, tragedy, the agony, the difficulty, uh, the trauma of uh, Afghanistan, you know, is uh, in a sense sort of by design. It is uh, deliberate. Uh, and uh, we all know history that, uh, you know, this was not the first time, and I can tell you that this will not be the last time either. And I think we need to sort of put the Afghan situation in the context of the international political economy. And that is to say, uh, to apply the so-called dependency theory to the uh, American occupation of Afghanistan. Um, and we should also see this as the north-south uh, division of labor and resources uh, globally where um, the resourceful but poor uh, South provide the necessary resources, markets, and labor for the developed uh, North. Um, and also um, the so-called, uh, the idea of the rentier state. Uh, uh, the United States and global powers, you know, trying to uh, use and abuse uh, and exploit um, ruling elites throughout the world in order to achieve um, their own objectives. Uh, and I would also add uh, that uh, there's sort of a, an undercurrent of Islamophobia to the West, the American behavior vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and other third world, in particular, Muslim countries, uh, Libya, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Lebanon, um, Somalia, uh, Yemen, um, and other places, and we know this part of the world, and we know what they have did in this Southeast Asia. So Islamophobia, I would say, is perhaps uh, a part of this. Um, finally, what I'd like to do is, uh, where do we go from here and what should be done? And I just want very quickly to um, state what should be done. I think uh, the United States and the world uh, should quickly recognize uh, the Taliban, um, given all of the reservations and given the fact that we have to see how the Taliban would actually do, will they deliver on their proclamations and rhetoric or not. But at this point, uh, we should end uh, the agony of the people of Afghanistan, recognize the country, uh, release Afghanistan's $10 billion in the US banks, um, start helping Afghanistan. Uh, and no sanctions of any kind by anybody uh, whatsoever uh, in the world uh, and the United States need to provide the basic needs of the Afghan people, food, shelter, healthcare, 
um, and uh, water, electricity, uh, and so forth. Um, we, the world community, must immediately uh, start helping Afghanistan to fight the, the corona, uh, the drought, um, and also uh, the, uh, the difficulties that the country has. Um, and there should be no war of proxy, uh, no over the horizon uh, attacks on Afghanistan through planes from the Gulf states uh, um, or drones, uh, you know, or you no know, other CIA agents and death squads and so forth. All of that must end uh, very quickly. Um, the world community should uh, guarantee uh, a good po neighborly policy between Afghanistan and its neighbors, uh, Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, China, and so forth. And it's interesting, I think, to point out that um, uh, most of these countries have not vacated their embassies. Uh, the Chinese, the Russians, um, and the Iranians, uh, you know, all of these people continue to have their embassies uh, in, in the UN uh, agencies. Uh, I think the world should uh, reestablish and strengthen its uh, diplomatic, uh, political, economic, and other kinds of relationships uh, with Afghanistan. The world community must guarantee Afghanistan's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and neutrality, and um, prevent uh, the uh, inter-ethnic conflict. So what I worry about uh, a lot is uh, uh, because of these uh, changes, uh, uh, a, a, the resurgence of ethnic, um, regional, and other conflict in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and finally, uh, I would uh, urge the world community to uh, put a UN peacekeeping force uh, in place in Afghanistan as quickly as possible. The UN peacekeeping force can maintain law and order, peace, observe the Taliban behavior on a daily basis on the ground and report or hold them uh, responsible and uh, accountable and, and so forth but also the UN peacekeeping force, and there should be an agent of the peacekeeping force as a development force uh, uh, and uh, a rebuilding force. Uh, the world should uh, establish a trust fund for Afghanistan. That money should go to the trust fund and then spent by uh, international organizations uh, very, very um, carefully, and every dollar should be account. The world should repatriate all of the stolen money, treasures, and historical objects that were stolen over the last 20 years uh, from Afghanistan, stolen by some international elements and uh, some Afghan uh, elements. Um, and uh, again, we need to develop on a massive, um, uh, you know, massive development uh, uh, program. Uh, that will uh, meet the needs of the Afghan uh, people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Zahir Wahab, uh, for uh, giving us the background and your perspective. Uh, now, uh, the next speaker, uh, guest speaker we have is uh, Dr. Taimur Rahman, who is the uh, General Secretary of the Masdur Kisan Party. Um, and uh, he will give us the uh, perspective from Pakistani left. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald. And I'm very excited to be invited by uh, the DSA. I've uh, uh, not had the pleasure to interact much with the DSA when I was a college student in the USA, but I read an, uh, a lot about uh, your activities. And I must say, I'm very, very pleased and honored to be invited given the incredible network of people that you've created. Um, when I was in college in the U.S., which was in Grinnell, Iowa, I got the opportunity to be, uh, you know, in contact and in touch with uh, the anti-war movement. And uh, so my, uh, many of my perspectives on what has happened in Afghanistan were shaped, and also Iraq and other parts of the world, uh, have been shaped by, by the U.S. left in that sense. And uh, so there was something that came from uh, the U.S. left with, with which I'd like to begin. Uh, you know, the Frankfurt School of Thought, uh, Adorno and others often remarked that cap the capitalist system is built in such a way that it causes all of us to be in a perpetual state of depression. 
Um, but this, uh, this meme is just brilliant because what it says is when you feel life is going nowhere, obviously because of capitalism, just remember four US presidents, 20 years, $2 trillion, 2,300 soldiers' lives uh, achieved regime change in Afghanistan from the Taliban to the Taliban. So after 20 years of intervention and occupation, we are right back where we started from. What was the purpose of this entire operation and occupation? If the purpose was that, that the Americans wanted to, to, uh, uh, to get rid of the Taliban, well, the minute they left, the Taliban came back into power. If the purpose wa was that um, um, it was to catch Osama bin Laden and the perpetrators of the terrorist attack uh, on the World Trade Center on 9-11, well, that happened about 10 years ago or so. They could have left immediately after uh, you know, killing uh, bin Laden in Aftabad, Pakistan. If the purpose was to somehow or the other have some strategic sort of uh, uh, you know, positioning vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the underbelly of Russia, China, or Iran. Well, I'm sure that strategic objective still exists, So, but the U US has and had to withdraw. So what, what, what really has been achieved? Uh, we, are, we would have been happy if, uh, 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 you know, if the American administration had said, well, the purpose was to do some nation building to help Afghanistan stand on its feet after so many years of civil war and war, et cetera. But clearly the American government has said very explicitly, Joe Biden has said very explicitly that our objective was never to, to you know, uh, for uh, it was never nation building. And that of course is also shown by the financial priorities uh, of how you know, money was allocated. For example, out of the $2 trillion that were, you know, that were spent on this occupation, um, according to um, American economist, um, uh, what's his name again, Richard Wolf, $1 trillion, that is half of that spending was given to military contractors. Clearly then the priority was not uh, uh, nation building, building schools and hospitals and roads and so on, but it was security. Uh, and if that was the objective, then it doesn't seem that anything really has been achieved. Now, some people in the United States have been arguing, and I'm sure uh, those people who oppose Joe Biden and uh, are uh, with the Republican Party have been arguing that uh, Biden is not uh, you know, uh, should have stayed on and this withdrawal was all wrong and they shouldn't have withdrawn and so on. Uh, I am, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the plans for this withdrawal were really laid down in the administration of Donald Trump. Uh, it was really from that period that this entire withdrawal, the idea yeah. of this withdrawal was, was being uh, supported by the American administration. So uh, the withdrawal had to occur and should have occurred. And in my opinion, should have occurred a long, long time ago. And also I think that any time the withdrawal had occurred, whether the withdrawal had occurred 10 years ago or had occurred another five years later, I think the results would not would have been roughly the same. Of course, things could have been done better. Of course, after the Doha agreement, maybe maybe you know they should have phased it, move people out in certain phases, and so on and so forth. All those arguments can be made. But I think where uh, uh, one country has occupied another country for twenty odd years, any kind of withdrawal is, and where the occupied country has built up its state structure purely on the foundation of that occupation, where the financial resources for that new state structure come from the occupation itself. There, I think any kind of withdrawal under any circumstances would generally and necessarily have resulted in chaos. So the, the kind of chaos that we've seen, some of it might've been worse, some of it might've been bad. Hence, in my opinion, there is no argument that can be made at this point in time that American forces ought to have remained in Afghanistan a moment longer. In fact, the argument that is to be made right now is that the American forces should have withdrawn from Afghanistan a long, 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 long time ago. In fact, if you ask me my personal opinion, um, I think they should have never gone to Afghanistan in the first place. I spent uh, you know, most of um, uh, 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 my life arguing the case that the occupation of Iraq, Afghanistan and other third world countries is an imperialist venture and should be opposed completely and unequivocally. Now, uh, amongst the left, there are some people who are not very clear about what the Taliban represent because when they look at the question of imperialism, they only look at the question of imperialism from one angle or aspect, theoretically speaking. That is, they tend to look at the question of imperialism from the point of view of what imperialism does uh, to the question of uh, national sovereignty. 
Of course, imperialism will inevitably violate national sovereignty, not just in one country, but in many countries around the globe, it will necessarily undermine it because wherever investment goes, their investment has to be solidified, it has to be secured. And there, of course, wherever the dollar goes, wherever McDonald's goes, therefore, there will have to be some security for American capital. And so you can expect that the American military either directly in extreme cases or in other cases through proxy forces will secure its investment. So in that context, of course, we can understand that uh, imperialism constantly creates a crisis of national sovereignty. It cannot but create a crisis of national sovereignty. But national sovereignty is only one of the crises created by imperialism. It's not the sole crisis, and it's not the way we must understand things. Because consider that Pakistan is an entirely independent country in the context of what we consider the ostensible formal uh, criteria of uh, national sovereignty. And yet, economically speaking, we can't move a little finger without the IMF and without uh, international financial help. So from that perspective, in my opinion, imperialism is not just about um, national sovereignty, although that is a very important task, but it is also about imperialism is really a stage of capitalism. It's not the United States alone, which is in that sense, an imperial, I, mean, I think that, you know, the establishment, the military establishment of the United States does represent imperialism, but that is not what imperialism is solely about. It's not solely about occupation and invasion, although that's part and parcel of it. Imperialism from our perspective is a stage in the development of capitalism. It is capitalism. It's not separate from capitalism. Capitalism is in the stage of imperialism. Hence to be anti-imperialist in the true sense, in our opinion, is really to oppose this, the, to oppose international capital. And the Taliban are not in any sense anti-imperialist at all. In fact, in the Doha agreement, they have come to an understanding of the United States of America that America's strategic interests and security interests will be consolidated. The first thing that the Taliban have done since they have come to power is to have stated very clearly and openly that they are ready to do business with the United States and they are ready to uh, invite capital from the United States of America. Hence, the what the Taliban really represent is the reactionary side of Afghan society and the reactionary side of Pakistani society. Because we often seem to forget when we look at this question purely from the, from the framework of national sovereignty or national liberation, is that societies like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq are also complex societies. They are also broken up into many, many classes. There are classes in Pakistan that represent the Jagirdari Nizam, which is the pre-capitalist mode of production. There are classes in Pakistan that represent the urban bourgeoisie, uh, sometimes linked to international capital, sometimes opposed to international capital. There are classes in Pakistan that are in the middle. There, is a, there are rich peasants and there are poor peasants and there are middle peasants and there are landless peasants and there are of course proletarians and workers and, uh, and so on and so forth. So Pakistan as well as Afghanistan are complex class societies. And in these complex class societies, every class will have a different perspective. And so it's not that Afghanistan is one and now it's liberated under the Taliban, no. Afghanistan also has classes and uh, so as does Pakistan, as does Iraq, and those classes have, uh, are organized in different political parties. And what Taliban really represent are the remnants or the, what remains of uh, the counter-revolution, the fascist militias, the counter-revolution that was created uh, during the Cold War to stop the Saur revolution. And the Northern Alliance, in all honesty and frankly, is no different from that. It is also part of the counter-revolutionary bloc created um, by support from imperialism, as well as support from Saudi Arabia, Britain and France and Israel in order that uh, Afghanistan should not go in a, and, and Pakistan should not go in a progressive direction. So in that sense, I don't necessarily, it doesn't, I, I don't follow the, framework in which I see the Taliban as being progressive and the Northern Alliance as being reactionary, nor do I follow the framework in which I see the Northern Alliance as being progressive and the Taliban as being reactionary. In fact, I see it in the framework of, imagine to give you an example, I see it in the framework that, you remember that uh, the United States supported the Contras in Nicaragua. Imagine if the Contras began to fight each other. Would we consider one section of the Contras to be progressive versus the other section of the Contras? I don't think so. Uh, such is the case, in my opinion, with Afghanistan. Neither of these forces, the Northern Alliance nor the Taliban, have the capacity 
are rooted in the kind of social forces that can cause the Renaissance regeneration of Afghan society or Pakistan. It's one reactionary, I'm sorry to sound so cynical, normally I sing songs of hope, etc. But uh, the cold hard truth is that neither imperialism, nor the Northern Alliance, nor the Taliban, and nor the Pakistani establishment represent, in our view, in our, from our perspective, forces that can bring about a progressive change in the country. Now, there have been huge protests in London uh, of the Afghan community, and some very incredibly brave protests inside Afghanistan for the Afghan flag. There is also, of course, Ahmed Masood, who has taken control of the Panjshir Valley. And the latest news is that he's managed to take maybe one or two districts adjoining to the Panjshir Valley. Um, and some people are now arguing that maybe we should support them and have a proxy war in Afghanistan. I am not of that view. I am not of that view because as uh, uh, Dr. Zahid Bahab also clarified, Afghanistan has suffered enormously from, you know, from war for the last half century. And uh, we don't want to see more war and bloodshed in Afghanistan. I think what can develop Afghanistan is, 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 is if there has to be some peaceful economic development so that Afghanistan can finally come on the, on the groove of moving forward historically, politically, socially, culturally, in other ways. And honestly, I'm not seeing that happen. We're not really seeing that happening at the moment, despite the fact that we want to see that. And the, the state that I hold, I personally hold most responsible for the mess that has been created in Afghanistan is my own state, Pakistan. When I went to Afghanistan, um, uh, I visited, I sang songs there, I you know, delivered lectures, etc. I had heard and read and I knew from my friends that there was a lot of hostility to Pakistanis in Kabul and in and around Kabul. But when I went there, I experienced with my wife and with my friend, etc. I experienced it firsthand. I saw it for myself. And it was palpable. It was so real. Uh, and I think most Pakistanis are not aware of this. And I pro probably most Americans are also not aware of this. And the reason why there is so much hatred uh, for Pakistanis in Kabul, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, because being a Pakistani, at one or two points when I was visiting uh, you know, barbers, uh, gardens, etc. The policeman asked, asked me, where are you from? And I didn't want to show him my passport and, you know, go into the details of where I was from and so on. So, so I said, I'm from India. He said, oh, okay, okay, go, go. <laughs> if I had said I'm from Pakistan, he would have said, all right, you just wait here, show me your passport, your travel papers, your visa, and would have detained me for 25 minutes. So, you know, um, that was the state. Why is this the case? Pakistanis need to understand this, and many of my comrades are here as well. This is the case, not necessarily because of the Saudi revolution, but it started much earlier. And it has little to do with Afghanistan and more to do with Pakistan. In 1971, East Pakistan separated from Pakistan and became Bangladesh. From that point onwards, whatever fears the Pakistani establishment had about the existential um, status of Pakistan were compounded enormously and the view was strengthened that Pakistan's, the, the biggest th security and major threat to Pakistan's existence comes mainly from India, which might support secessionist nationalist movements within Pakistan, as was the case in East Pakistan. Hence, the Pakistan military not only wanted to suppress all nationalist movements within Pakistan, including Baloch, Pashtun, Sindhi nationalists, etc., but in addition to that, wanted to suppress any uh, any, any other country that may, that was or may in the future support those nationalist movements. Moreover, Pakistan thought that if there was a future war with India, that, uh, that Indians would try to cut Pakistan into, could easily cut Pakistan into half. And if that were the case, then North Pakistan and South Pakistan would not be able to coordinate any, uh, in any defensive war. And therefore, Pakistan, Pakistan must, have, must have what they call strategic depth in the sense that um, in Afghanistan, there must be a regime which is friendly to Pakistan so that if there's war with India, they can use Afghan territory to maneuver in that war with India. That policy was, uh, you know, uh, was implemented in the, during the left-wing government of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto in the early 1970s when uh, uh, Daud was the prime minister and later president of Afghanistan. In other words, before the Saur revolution, 
um, the Pakistani government was big, developed relations with people like Gulbuddin Hikmatyar and many of the other uh, 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 Mujahid, quote, so quote unquote, Mujahideen commanders. So the, the meddling of the Pakistani government goes back a long, long way to the early 1970s. And throughout these 50 years, the forces that Pakistan have promoted in Afghanistan have never been progressive forces. They've never supported Democrats. They've never supported secular people. They've never supported people who stand up for women's rights or who stood up for constitutional government or said we should need, we need to have a democratic state in Afghanistan. They stood with the most right-wing, rapidly reactionary fanatics and narrow-minded people. And they continue to build the narrative. This is not our doing. It's just how the Afghans are. The Afghans are fanatics and that's why, you know, they support fanaticism. Whereas in fact, this was very much a deliberate ploy by the, and a narrative that was developed by the Pakistani state in the 1970s and accelerated in the 1980s during the period of Ziaul Haq. Ziaul Haq began the intervention in, in Afghanistan and invited the United States of America and Israel to join him in the war against uh, uh, what was then a progressive regime in Afghanistan. So people need to understand that all essentializing arguments about Pashtuns, about the Afghans as being inherently, uh, you know, quote unquote, backward or fanatical or religious, etc., are products, number one, of what the Pakistani establishment have been doing, and number two, of the Cold War. And we need to get out of that essentialist narrative and understand the Afghan people for who they really are, which will always be not one person, not one personality, but a diversity of people, classes, personalities, nations, uh, nationalities, ethnicities, and so on. Now, the Taliban victory in uh, Afghanistan will have and is having many negative uh, repercussions in Pakistan. First, the biggest repercussion, of course, is that the right-wing reactionary forces of Pakistan are emboldened and feel that what the, the victory in Afghanistan must be replicated in Pakistan and that Pakistan must also become a theocratic state, so an emirate of, you know, an Islamic emirate, much like uh, Afghanistan is, is, uh, is perhaps going to become soon. And so we see the JUI, for example, celebrating the victory of the Taliban in a little more muted way. We also see the Jamaat Islami celebrating the victory of the Taliban. And we see on Twitter uh, that people who generally support uh, the you know, establishment kind of politics have been talking about the victory of the Taliban and have been creating the in totally incorrect impression that the Taliban have sub suddenly and magically transformed. And now they understand human rights and democracy and so on and so forth. This, of course, is complete nonsense. What the second major issue that Pakistan is going to confront is that when Baghdad Air Base was taken over by the Taliban, thousands of prisoners there were released. Of the thousands of prisoners released there, 2,300 were Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, members of the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan. Now, in case you don't know, the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, TTP, was created in 2007 by Baitullah Mesoud. And it declared war on the Pakistani state, as a result of which 80,000 people died and about 2.2 million people were internally displaced within Pakistan. The TTP created a regime of terror inside Pakistan, butchering people, slaughtering them, hanging up their dead bodies in the street shop. The reason why they named themselves Tariqe Taliban, Tariqe Taliban Pakistan is because they were inspired in this action by the government of Afghanistan between 1996 and 2001. That is the TTA, the Tariqe Taliban Afghanistan. They felt this kind of justice is the kind of justice we need to enforce in Pakistan. That is a rough justice, pick up somebody, whoever they are, hang them, you know, display their body on the street, et cetera, et cetera, and commit acts of terrorism. During that period where the TTP insurgency was going on, um, they, they bombed schools, they bombed hospitals, they bombed uh, airports, they bombed uh, uh, churches, they bombed uh, bazaars, they bombed, uh, you know, people where people, you know, come together. So it was an incredibly horrific period for, in Pakistan's history. And I fear that that horrific period is going to come back as a result of the victory of the Taliban in Afghanistan. We are going to experience a very serious blowback in Pakistan, not only in the shape of escalating of the escalating religious right politics, but even in the shape of TTP, uh, 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 you know, restarting its jihad in Pakistan 
and bringing ordinary civilians in the line of fire in, 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 uh, by their actions. So I'll end there uh, by just saying that I completely agree with Wahab Sahab when he says that uh, outside powers have meddled enough in the, with, the, with the politics and history of Afghanistan. What Afghanistan needs is it does not need American intervention. It does not need a Russian intervention. It does not need an Irani intervention. It does not need an Uzbek or a Tajik intervention. It does not need any kind of intervention. And especially what it does not need is a Pakistani intervention. What Afghanistan needs is to, Afghans will, can and will sort out their problems themselves. And when they sort out their problems themselves, that is the only thing that will create a stable Afghan state and society. And it is the same with Pakistan. In fact, I would even be bold enough to venture and say that it is the same with the entire third world. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Rahman uh, from the DSA International Committee. Uh, that is very informative. Uh, now, uh, our next speaker is uh, Mei Zhang, uh, who is an investigative journalist with uh, Vanity Fair and whose uh, reporting on Afghanistan has appeared on uh, various outlets from The Intercept to The New York Times. Uh, and she'll speak about uh, the role of the media and also relief efforts and organizations. Uh, Mei, you have the floor. Hello. Um, I, oh, okay, great. Um, I, don't have much to say. I'm happy to take questions later. Obviously, it's an incredibly chaotic time. Um, I was asked what would be most helpful. Um, I always refer people to Emergency. It's an Italian-run NGO that runs um, uh, hospitals, uh, surgical wards for the war wounded. They do phenomenal work. I've seen their work up close, and uh, I recommend that very much. Um, and then the other thing is we need an anti-war movement without it, not, you know, there's no, none of these efforts will make any difference. And America seems to have this um, uh, uh, astonishing ability to wage war every generation. Um, and so, you know, maybe come 2050, we might be engaged in another, another conflict. And, and to avoid that, it, what, what needs to happen is, yeah, there needs to be a consensus that, um, the thing to prioritize is not American victory, but um, uh, peace. Um, role of the media, uh, what is there to say? There's a lot of, I mean, I, I mean, there's nothing new that I can say. You know, there's been a lot of reportage um, about the airport, uh, which is understandable. That's where the action is, but um, it is a kind of a metaphor for how the Western media is, um, reported on the war this whole time, uh, huge concentrations in ur urban centers, which again is in some ways understandable. That's where you have access. People speak English. It's an easy way to be. Um, but we have no idea what's happening in Saripol or Host or you know, literally any of the other places. I don't know how, how big the airport is. I'm actually, um, I've been trying to figure that out. But the, 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 the geographical area of the airport you know, is not the country. And that dissonance has always been a problem. Um, there's been no coverage of Afghanistan really in the past couple of years. And uh, that's, that's you know, telling as well that we really only started hearing about, I, I, I am kind of fascinated by what actually get, you know, twice, I'm in New York twice this week on the air, uh, not the airport, um, subway. I overheard people talk about Afghanistan and that hasn't happened in the past many years. And so I think what Americans care about maybe is shocking images, just multiple series of shocking images dispersed uh, over a very short period of time, which is maybe a bit cynical to, to think about. Um, and uh, what was the third? Oh, relief efforts. Um, yeah, relief efforts, are. it's sort of difficult to scale because it's just all being done on various phones with people who have connections. Um, to you know, material, uh, people, yeah, people who have access to things, and so um, I'm not quite sure. I have received a lot of messages about what can I do, and it's a bit difficult to. Um, I just don't have the capacity to even 
deputize, and I don't know if anyone does uh, now. Um, but what 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 I am told is helpful is to let um, your elected officials know that this is an issue that you care about, and that obviously the right thing to do is you know not only bring our allies home, but I mean, everyone deserves to leave. I don't, I don't blame people for, you know, rushing to the airport, trying to get on whatever plane without even knowing what the destination is. I think that should tell you all about, um, uh, yeah, like quality of life in Afghanistan. No one wants to live there clearly. Um, and that's after, as we know, two trillions of dollars in 20 years of engagement. Um, it's a pretty damning indictment on um, America, uh, Western sorry, intervention in Afghanistan. Um, and then otherwise, uh, sorry, just um, otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to take specific questions actually. I think that might be maybe more helpful. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, May. Um, yeah, uh, I also, again, want to give a shout out to uh, the uh, the call to action section and the resources. Uh, Dylan, he posted in the chat, uh, dsaic.org slash Afghanistan dash actions, uh, which should have a number of these links. Um, so uh, again, uh, I want to thank uh, all of the guest speakers uh, who uh, came here to give their presentations. Uh, now let's move on to the Q&A. Uh, we have a fair number of questions uh, that we will try to uh, cover as much as possible here. Uh, but if it is not, uh, it should be covered either in the presentation um, or uh, we're going to send a follow-up email containing links to resources um, and uh, calls to action, which should hopefully answer some of the questions that might not be answered today. Um, all right, so let's move on to the Q&A. Uh, the first question we have is from Kai Mueller. Uh, so some activists uh, support sanctioning Pakistan for supporting the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Uh, what do the speakers here think of this proposal? It's an absurd proposal because sanctions are an anti-people weapon. I remember when the war against Iraq was going on, um, there were some people who said, oh, let's sanction I Iraq and then the uh, uh, Saddam regime will, will, will fall. And uh, sanctions were imposed against Iraq and they were debilitating for the economy. And the Saddam regime was strengthened. It didn't fall. It was in fact, uh, you know, strengthened by what was perceived to be an injustice against the people. So I think uh, if someone, um, Mira Wood has also written, uh, sanctions are an anti-people weapon. And frankly, sanctions do not weaken governments generally uh, because sanctions are perceived by the general public as being uh, discriminatory against an entire people and are perceived moreover as being, um, uh, what's the right word, uh, a form of collective punishment. Uh, so you're gonna punish all of Pakistan for the actions of the government. That being said, um, so whereas economic sanctions I think are uh, completely off the table, that being said, um, uh, other forms of aid and assistance that may be given to a government can sometimes be used to persu persuade a government uh, not to pursue a certain policy. So for instance, uh, if Pakistan is getting a certain amount of money from XYZ country, and that XYZ country says, we don't want you to, you know, we want you to lay off uh, the Taliban, uh, I don't necessarily consider that a bad thing. But I will also point out to you that for the last 20 years, the American establishment has been saying only and only one thing to the Pakistani government and establishment again and again and again. You're not doing enough. Do more, do more, do more, do more. And the Pakistan government, uh, the sorry, not the government, I mean to say the military in Pakistan, if you look at the interviews of General Pervez Musharraf, they had a very clear policy that we are ready and willing to hand over all foreign militants who are in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, Arab militants, etc. given what happened in 9-11, but the Taliban should not be touched. That was the view of the Pakistan military explicitly stated by General Pervez Musharraf. So I'm not even sure that the arm twisting uh, of uh, foreign powers is necessarily going to have such a serious impact in Pakistan. I think in the final analysis, the greatest strength 
um, that can stop ta the Talibanization of Pakistan and Afghanistan are the people of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So what we need to seriously think about are not sanctions and not arm twisting of government by denying them aid or so on and so forth, but rather how can we come, how can the anti-war movement in the United States of America come and together with the progressive movement of Pakistan, how can we build that synergy such that we can strengthen each other and that we can stop this. Start. That is the number one thing. And I think we pay too little attention to that and too much attention to other mechanisms that have not really yielded the right results. So my view always has been, we need a bottom up movement of the people against religious extremism. Um, yes, I'd like to add to what Dr. Rahman said. Um, if we look at the sanctions, whether it's Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, um, Iraq, uh, or now Afghanistan maybe, we can see that uh, sanctions uh, penalize the masses, the people who are being penalized to begin with in some ways. Uh, and sanctions are usually imposed on uh, countries that are trying to uh, develop their own, to de-link from the West, uh, uh, sanctions are imposed on people who want to uh, end uh, capitalism in its ugly form in their own countries, de-link from imperialism and capitalism and develop autonomous, uh, self-reliant uh, systems, economic, political, uh, etc. So sanctions would be uh, wrong. Uh, on the contrary, I would say that uh, developed nations or the world community should help the masses and should in fact help uh, countries that are trying to stand on their own feet and, and de-link from uh, imperialism and capitalism. Uh, and the question of Pakistan is, I think is pointed out by Dr. Rahman, um, Pakistan and the United States have been you know, allies in the CETO pact, uh, and they have always sort of helped each other. And we know that um, Pakistan was very instrumental uh, along with Saudi Arabia and the United States. These three were the country that actually um, helped some people. And even before the Mujahideen and the, their anti-Soviet um, Union struggle. So I think in Pakistan in the process have enriched itself uh, by a lot of aid from the United States and from Gulf states, uh, and it has strengthened its military. But the people, you know, in Pakistan, I have been to Pakistan several times. Unfortunately, people's lives are difficult. Um, so what we need to do, and of course, um, if we look at the imperialist uh, uh, shenanigans in Afghanistan, you know, Af it has always intervened. Uh, you know, Britain intervened in the 1920s, and then the United States, of course, uh, in 1974, uh, when Daoud came into power and established the Republican, and then in 1978, when the PDPA, uh, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the Socialists, in all three of these cases, um, the West sort of mobilized itself very, very quickly, and when uh, after these three regimes who try to actually feed and health and, you know, clothe their own people and, you know, develop their own economies and non-aligned independent policy and so forth. Uh, but, you know, uh, impaired the imperialist West went after them and undermined them in some way. So I think what the world needs to do is to make sure that no country intervenes in Afghan affairs directly or indirectly, uh, directly or through proxies, for example. So the world needs to put the pressure on Pakistan to say, stop intervening in Afghan affairs. Uh, instead, to try to help you know, Afghanistan develop because it is good both for all of its neighbors. But if, if Afghanistan is, uh, uh, unstable, uh, if it's chaotic, uh, if it's problematic, inevitably it would affect its neighbors, Iran, you know, China, even Pakistan and so forth. So it behooves the world to support um, Afghanistan in its efforts to develop a progressive uh, economy, uh, polity, uh, culture, uh, education and so forth.
Thank you uh, for your comments, uh, Dr. Rahman and Dr. Wahab. Um, so let's move on to the uh, next question. We have 10 minutes remaining in the Q&A. Uh, so uh, the next question that we have is, um, can the speaker say as to what is the likely class slash political composition of, um, of the Afghans who will now join the diaspora, who will become our neighbors, and how we can best insist that they get all the needed assistance? I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if I got the question. Can you sort of restate it in your own word, please? Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, can the speaker say what is the likely class uh, com class and the political compositions of the Afghan refugees um, uh, and uh, how we can uh, best assist them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as I said, you know, the, one of the first things uh, the world needs to do is again uh, mobilize uh, and deliver aid very promptly, uh, humanitarian aid, because most Afghans are suffering, and not just those who are at the airport, but you know the the vast majority of the, the population, um, uh, and also quickly and stop intervening so that uh, the Afghan financial system, banks, exchangers people's salaries, uh, government working, etc. So th these can be uh, normalized, but also there are world agencies, you know, um, UNRWA, uh, you know, the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, uh, you know, that can channel um, uh, aid to the Afghan refugees, but we need to quickly uh, sort of help, try to stabilize the situation, uh, you know, support uh, monitor, uh, hold responsible uh, the new regime so that it can help its own people uh, instead of penalizing, you know, either the country or uh, the the population, um, so that nothing can 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 be done. Thank you. Because, uh, the answer, I think, in my view, the answer is not to. Uh, take people out. I mean, if you take, let's say, half a million Afghan refugees overseas, what about the other 34 million people? I mean, we need to, again, uh, think about the, the general population and what they need, what they want, and how we can serve them instead of focusing on air airport to sort of uh, uh, therapeutically make ourselves feel good and humane and helpful. We need to help the country. Right, I think uh, Wahab Saab has answered the question adequately. I don't need to say anything further in this regard. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wahab. Uh, with that being answered, uh, let's move on to the uh, next question that we have. Um, so uh, from a leftist perspective, how should a withdrawal have been done? Uh, did the uh, Trump administration commit a mistake in pushing for a withdrawal agreement with Taliban without pushing for power sharing with the, uh, I guess, the now previous Afghan government? I think that would have been better had they come to a power sharing agreement, uh, but I think they didn't expect that the Northern Alliance would collapse so quickly uh, and that the Taliban would uh, come to power so rapidly. I don't think they expected that at all. And that's why they didn't uh, work on that. Um, from a progressive perspective, I'd say that even if the ostensible aims of the occupation of Afghanistan were taken at face value, which was that uh, you know America was attacked at, uh, on 9-11, uh, if that ostensible claim is taken purely, at, even if that claim is taken purely at face value, then from that perspective itself, uh, the United States of America should have left after they managed to kill Osama bin Laden. Uh, I think they should have been managed in the period of Obama, and the Xi should have done it, uh, and I think that would have been fantastic. I don't know. You have to tell us uh, why. Why didn't uh, the U.S. Why did the U.S. stay another? decade uh, and not withdraw after they got Osama bin Laden? What was the point? I, I never understood it. I've still not been able to understand it. Well, I think the point was that it is again uh, imperialism, direct or indirect. Uh, you're right. Uh, you know, uh, if the question was the attack 
which didn't happen, as I said, or you said. Um, so what was the point? But the point was maybe um, we also have to recognize the, the military industrial intelligence and media complex in the United States and how it works. Wars are very profitable, very useful, very functional for corporate capitalism, for the military industrial complex. And we know that most of the money, Jeffrey Sachs pointed this out in a very nice uh, write up yesterday, uh, you know, that of all of the money, a trillion dollars, 145 billion for the Afghan court development, of all of that money, only 2% of it actually ended up getting to the public, the, the target population. Most of the money came back to the United States and to the West and went into the stocks uh, of, uh, you know, the military industrial uh, complex. So, uh, and this was imperialism, as I said, plain and simple, uh, direct or indirect, uh, because imperialists simply globally cannot allow governments, uh, nations to become self-reliant, self-sufficient, independent, and especially if they're in the process of delinking from the capitalist West. Uh, such things will not be allowed. Uh, otherwise, what was the sin of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, although they were not saints, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador, uh, you know, Iraq, uh, uh, and even Afghanistan, especially under the PDPA. It's very clear, uh, you know, what the world is all about. And that is, say, the struggle between the developed North and the underdeveloped South. And the underdeveloped South uh, is going to be a very hard time to actually delink itself from the developed imperialist north. All right. Thank you uh, to both of you. Uh, let's move on to the uh, next question, which is um, what can socialists in the United States advocate for that would best benefit Afghanistan going forward to avoid another long conflict and war? Dr. Rahman. Sorry, um, could you please repeat the question? Sorry. I'll give you time. <laughs> well, I think what the, you can think about it. Uh, the, the, the SDA, you know, like all citizens in, in America or in the world, I think uh, what they should do again is uh, uh, use these examples uh, in our own lives to see, you know, who was who, what was what, what was the struggle about? You know, what is the crime of the Cuban, Nicaraguan, Afghan, Pakistani people? Any people, you know, it's a few individuals, some movements or the ruling elites, the predatory class, which happen to have more in common with the, with the developed North than with their own people, you know? So I think our struggle, uh, and it's not, it's endless. Uh, our struggle should be about peace, uh, democracy, sovereignty, uh, and a different um, uh, model to capitalism, you know, where most people can actually have decent lives. So I think the DSA and all Americans should be pressuring our authorities here for a different kind of policy, a different kind of relationship with the developing uh, world and a different kind of domestic policies, uh, you know, de-emphasis on militarization and emphasis on Human services, I mean, we have problems in Portland City. Uh, you know, uh, we have problems all over the world. So people should work for peace, for justice, for democracy, for a sort of a um, democratic socialism uh, in short, you know, and these struggles would need a lot of uh, uh, time and, and work and effort. Please, Dr. Rahman. Sorry, I've been uh, typing answers here because there's a lot of, lot of different questions. Uh, let's go to the next uh, question, Ron. What, what do you think? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, this that would conclude our uh, Q and A. Uh, okay. So uh, again, uh, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists uh, who uh, joined us uh, today uh, for giving your insightful presentations and answers. Um, I. Uh, also want to reiterate that uh, we are going to send a follow-up email, uh, which would uh, contain the recording uh, 
calls to action and all of the other resources so that uh, everyone who's interested in getting involved can do so. Um, so uh, let's move on to the uh, next section, which is calls to action for DSA members, uh, which will be uh, given by Grace and Lindsay. Great, thank you so much, Ron, and to the panel. This has been an incredible discussion. Uh, my name's Lindsay. I'm on the steering committee of DSA's International Committee. And what we wanna do now that we've all been so inspired by all of this is make sure that everyone knows how to plug in. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that this works. Um, all right, so the problem before us is enormous but we want to say that we want you to plug in at the level that makes sense for you. So you can grow your role in a way that the minimum amount of time you can commit, we can plug you in. So uh, the six kind of steps we wanna talk about are just making sure you know what's going on, being plugged in just to information, joining a group, uh, building relationships and trying to bring other people into the movement, uh, creating organizing spaces yourself, and then actually working on building actions and campaigns um, to help the anti-war movement um, and everything we talked about today. Um, and then finally doing political education, but that's not something we're going to talk about today. So uh, again, most of these things are linked in the actions document that we've been sharing in the chat. But the first thing you can do if you're brand new to everything you've heard about today, to DSA, to the International Committee, to the anti-war movement is just to plug yourself in. If you're a Twitter user, an Instagram user, you like email, whatever you can do, um, there are some links here that you should follow the International Committee, groups like Afghans for a Better Tomorrow, and then we'll also be sharing um, in that document um, great videos from um, our panelists here today. Um, so just informing yourself is step one. Uh, and then learning with others is the next step. So just knowing what's going on isn't as helpful, but becoming a member of a group is great. So you're most likely here because you're a DSA member and we're sharing this panel as the international committee. And we really want to emphasize that everyone here should uh, join the international committee. So we can drop the link in the chat to that form that you can sign up, um, dsaic.org slash join. Uh, we'd love to have all of you, and there are nine different subcommittees that you can join that will meet your interests, such as anti-war, Asia and Oceania, Middle East and Africa, and we'd really uh, love to have you. And then there are many groups varying by location uh, that will be working on different things, whether it's refugee resettlement, anti-war movement, et cetera, and so on. And then there are also often local groups. Your mileage may vary on how these groups work locally, um, such as the War Resisters League um, that you can plug into as well. And then the next thing that we want to note is that organizers, um, once you're in a group and you know what's going on, uh, organizing is asking, asking other people to join the movement with us, right? So a big thing that we do uh, in DSA is think about conversations as structured organizing conversations. This is from Jane McAlevey. Many of you may be familiar with this, this idea. Um, but the idea is that you have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, understand them, but have an ask in mind for what you want to ask. And so what is a structured organizing conversation, an effective method for talking to people, having a meaningful conversation and making asks. And so here, when we're talking about all of the actions related to Afghanistan and the document we shared with you, some actions might be if you're talking to your comrade in DSA, um, you may say, there are resources for us to work on AUMF repeal. Is that something that you might want to do with me? Can you come to this rally with me on August 28th? Can you just read DSA's statement? Um, if maybe your comrade isn't already in the international committee, you can encourage them to join. Um, if it's just a friend, maybe you'll want to talk to them about donating to a fundraiser, um, working with a resettlement agency, even just joining DSA. And then there's a trick question at the end, which is if you find yourself on an event um, with an antagonist, uh, you're never going to convince them to get onto your side. So don't engage with them. And so the main steps of structured organizing conversations, we'll drop a link in the chat um, to these types of conversations is 
introduce yourself, find out what the person's all about, share the issues, get someone honestly kind of worked up, agitated, find out why are they upset about war, imperialism, Afghanistan, share your vision for what you're trying to accomplish, and then just put the question on the table. What can we do together um, and try to get them to sign up for something? Um, inoculation is a term for um, asking things, sharing things that might be brought up by people who don't agree with you um, to uh, kind of prepare people for arguments against what you're asking. And then finally, you just really wanna call the question and say, are you able to work on this with me and get someone to commit right then and there. I'm going to come to this meeting. I'm going to come to this rally. I'm going to talk with you right now about working on AUMF repeal, et cetera, and so on. And so uh, after you've talked to people, you know what's going on, uh, the next thing you can do is create organizing spaces. Um, so if you feel confident in doing that, that could mean anything. It could be forming a reading group, a working group, developing a campaign. There's so much support for you in DSA to build these things and from the International Committee. And we're so happy to help you uh, to do all of these things that we've talked about. Um, and so the first thing that we want to talk about is specifically our AOMF campaign. And Grace is here from uh, the No War campaign to talk about that. And we also can drop a link to anyone here who's interested in signing up on that campaign. So I will hand it over to Grace. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Grace, I use she, her pronouns and I am here on behalf of the No War campaign. Um, just for some background on us, uh, this campaign initially started um, when there was fear over um, whether or not the U.S. is going to go to war with Iran in the beginning of 2020, and it then developed into um, a bunch of different people and groups working together to oppose U.S. sanctions on countries like Iran, Cuba, North Korea, and Venezuela. Um, that work was uh, led by a lot of different diaspora groups. Um, but so now within the um, anti-war subcommittee, we have voted to make the no war campaign um, our priority. And so what that means is that um, we have a few goals, um, legislative goals in mind. We So the first is that we want to repeal the 2001 and 2002 authorizations for use of military force. Um, which many of you may know the 2001 um, AUMF, that's the acronym for it, um, was passed in 2001 and gave the president military or authorization to use military force against anyone that was involved in the 9-11 attacks. So it's very open-ended, had no geographic limitations on it. And so that was used as le the legal justification for what um, happened in Afghanistan over the past 20 years with the military occupations there. Um, and so through this work, we're trying to use a combination of legislative and base building tactics and really highlight the ways that the war on terror has threatened people and their lives around the globe. Um, and so, you know, Lindsay mentioned getting involved with anti-war work or starting up um, internationalist and anti-war working groups in your own chapter to kind of take on this campaign. That's uh, one of the ways we can do this um, currently. Um, we are not asking people to call their members of Congress to ask them to support the repeal of the 2001 or 2002 AUMFs because we recognize the severity of the situation in Afghanistan right now and the need for a lot of different people to evacuate. Um, but so we want to leave, you know, congressional phone lines open for calls to support Afghan refugees and the provision of humanitarian aid. Um, however, as we go along we, um, with our focus on the 2001 and 2002 AUMF appeals, we want to be really highlighting the ways that that intersects with other issues that DSA has been focused on um, with right now, you know, a clear one being 
the role that foreign occupation and intervention plays in creating mass displacement, both internally and externally, and causing refugee crises and just creating and feeding into situations in other countries that are unsafe for other folks. Um, I don't want to take up too much space here. So um, I will just end with um, a link that folks can fill out if you're interested in either getting involved or learning more about the campaign to repeal the AUMFs and um, overall end the war on terror. You can fill that out and we will be in touch with you. Um, I think that's all. Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay and Grace, uh, for you. the calls. Yeah. That was, uh, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much. Nice meeting you, Dr. Rahman. Take care. And likewise. Likewise, Wahab Sahab. Lovely to, to meet you. Let's stay in touch, please. Uh, I'll, I'll get your email and we should stay in touch. And uh, we would love to host you for similar seminars in Pakistan. It would be our honor. Thank you. It was really wonderful hearing you. We'll be very happy and honored. Thank you. Take care, all of you. Thank you, DSA. Thank you, DSA. Thank you, Lindsay, Ronald. Thank you, Dylan and Grace. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right now. Good in beer. And thanks to uh, all of the panelists, uh, Dr. Rahman, Dr. Wahab, and uh, Mei Zhang. Uh, we learned a lot from you today, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, working to build international solidarity uh, with y'all and with everyone in the audience. Uh, again, uh, be on the lookout for a follow-up email, which will contain all the resources, uh, calls to action, um, and tips and information on how to, be, uh, how to get involved uh, while this crisis is unfolding. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, solidarity. <laughs>